Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. What an audacious promise. No matter where you are in the world, we're coming for you. When I was a child, my mom had a version of that. Her version was, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> He's coming for you. This promise is so much better. Only a movement can make and keep that kind of a promise. After his resurrection, Jesus' disciples thought that was it. It's all done. Let's take over the world. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. I'm not staying. I'm going. But my father, your father, has a gift for you. He's going to give you the very energy and power that lifted me out of a tomb. And he's going to put that in you. And you are going to become the evidence that I'm still alive. And so on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them and began to transform them. And on that day, a movement began. Movements, interestingly, come actually from a collection of impactive moments. Those moments, I, I like to call them holy moments. They're holy moments because when you're a follower of Jesus and you are in that moment, the action you bring actually brings a presence and a power with it. The ancient Celtic Christians believed that there was a place called the thin place. It was a place where heaven and earth met together, and you could actually walk in both places at the same time. Abraham had a grandson. His name was Jacob, and Jacob was a deceiver. He was a manipulator. He was a thief. And while he was running away from his problems, he laid down exhausted and went to sleep, and as he was sleeping, he had this vision of this, this staircase coming down from heaven to earth and angels going up and coming back down again. And when he awakened, he said, God was in this place, and I did not know it. Those are holy moments. So can we talk about your holy moments this morning? And your holy moment may be a situation that was very explosive, and, and you, you, you were there and you said, I just, I feel God is here. But there are other holy moments that are nuanced. And if you're not careful, you miss it. It's one of those thin places that if you pay attention, you'll say, oh, God was in this place and I didn't know it. I wish you could meet my wife this morning. She's an amazing woman. We have been married 48 years, and the other day someone said to her, how long have you been married? And she said, way too long. <laughs> One day Pam went out and was gone, and it was, it was a torrential rain. It was really, it was pouring. She came back in, and she announced herself, said, hey, I'm home, and we have to get a new umbrella. I thought, well, what happened? She said, well, I was driving down Peach Street in Erie, PA, where we had lived, and, and she said, I saw this mom and her young child standing at a bus stop, and they were getting drenched, so I pulled over. And I said, do you need an umbrella? And then I said, well, you gave her your umbrella? She said, no, I gave him yours. <laughs> but at that bus stop at that moment, there was a thin place. There was a holy moment. Pam and I started a church in Boise, Idaho with three families. We moved into a rental house and we didn't get to meet our neighbors to the right for a while and finally there was a knock at the door and it was Jerry who was our next door neighbor. Jerry knocked on the door and the first words Jerry said to me, so you'll understand who Jerry is and what he's like, Jerry said, have there been any, any, any federal agencies asking about me? said, no, not yet. So Jerry was one of those guys that was just up and down. The guy had been a millionaire, up and down and up and down. He'd get it, he'd lose it. He'd get it, he'd lose it. He'd get it, he'd lose it. That was Jerry. 
And Jerry would have some really wild parties, our yards connected with a fence in between, and once in a while, Jerry would get really excited about his party, and he would throw all his, his cans and his bottles over into my yard. So I went out there one day, and I was not happy with Jerry. And I was muttering under my breath and probably pretty loud about how ridiculous this is. Why don't he grow up? Who does he think he is? And I was going through the whole thing, but I felt okay that I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. I'm picking up the cans, and I'm thinking to myself, I'll reward myself because on the way out the door, I smelled chocolate chip cookies. And Pam was making chocolate chip cookies, and I thought, there's my reward because she makes the best. I finished, threw the stuff in the trash can, went back in the house, and I looked around, and Pam wasn't there. And I thought, well, I smell chocolate chip cookies, but I don't see any. And so Pam walked in. I said, where you been? She said, oh, over. She said, well, I decided to take Jerry and Robin's our chocolate chip cookies because I want them to know that I love them. I said, I want my cookies. <laughs> but there to the right of our yard, at that moment, there was this thin place. There was this holy moment. A couple of weeks ago, I was in El Salvador. We went out to meet a woman who is part of Convoy of Hope's Empowering Women, where we take women who are thought as nothing more than just property, and we teach them their value in Jesus. We teach them their voice. We teach them their rights. We teach them who they are in Jesus, and we teach them parenting skills, and we teach them life skills, and we teach them business skills. We teach them how to start their own businesses, to take what they know how to do and turn it into a business, and then we give them the seed equipment to start the business, and we walk them through the growing of the business as they begin to hire family and other people around them, and it begins to change their community. And so we went, to, we went to see Martha. Martha came from a family. Her mother was a fisherwoman. She went out and fished the rivers. And so we went down to a delta to try to find her. And then eventually we saw her coming up. And she's pulling this boat behind her. And her husband goes out and helps her. And they're walking in mud up past their ankles, trying to get up to the bank. And they get to the bank. And there she stands, where she started fishing 6 o'clock the night before. And she fish, finishes at 8 o'clock in the morning. She and her husband, and her young child who sleeps in the boat while she fishes. She and her husband are standing there before us with, with mud up to here, and, and they're just telling us their story. And their story was that they lived in poverty and could not escape it. They barely could make enough a living, because usually the, the average wage at that, at that location is $8 a day, and they couldn't even make that because their, their nets were full of holes and they didn't have the proper equipment. So the, the wonderful team in El Salvador met with her and said, hey, we want to help you. So they started empowering her, and they taught her how to start a business, and then they gave her money, $150, and she went out and bought new nets. And as she began to, to, to use those nets, things got better, and then she went out and she bought material for other nets, and she made the nets, and she sold the nets. And then things got better because she sold the nets. She actually, she and her husband could buy a boat. Now, the boat doesn't have a motor yet, but they just, they go along the river with those long poles just pushing it ahead. And so we're asking her questions, and we said, so if you fish from 6 o'clock in the evening to 8 o'clock in the morning, what do you do with your equipment during the day? And they said, well, she can rent it out to make more money. They said, well, how, how much can she get? And they said, well, she can get $40 a day for that. And then Martha said this. She said, I don't ask $40 a day. Because I remember when I didn't have much at all, and I didn't know where help was coming from. And somebody showed me Jesus, and somebody showed me how I could live a life that would turn around poverty. And she says, I only charge $18 a day because I want those people who were in the condition I was to come back into the condition I, I now am. And at that moment, on that bank, there's a thin place. <laughs> there is this place. Where, where God is present. The thing about that kind of a thin place, those holy moments, is that they are otherworldly. 
the word holy, and, and a lot of you that have been in church have always heard that expression, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's around the throne room. Isaiah is there. He sees God on his throne, and he sees what is happening. And, and John, the, the one who wrote Revelation, says, I, I saw the same thing, and I saw these, these elders sitting before God, and they're bowing before him, crying, holy, 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 and then they look back up, and they cry, holy, 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 and there's this antiphonal chant going back and forth, and the word holy has a root meaning of this, other. And what's happening is as these elders are looking down, and they've just cried holy, they're looking down, they look back up, they see God in a brand new dimension they didn't see the last time they looked up. Because God fills every dimension we know of and the ones we don't know. Beauty and sounds, the visual, the presence. And so it's so overwhelming, they look back down again and they look back up and go, holy, holy, there's another other side of him. This is so otherworldly. We cannot become accustomed to this. In fact, it will take eternity to even begin to scratch the surface of his dimensions. A holy moment is a moment that is other than this world. It is countercultural. It's not what we're used to. It's not natural. If it was natural, I would keep my umbrella. If it was natural, I would call the cops on Jerry. If it is natural, Martha would get 40 bucks a day. But holy moments are other. Holy moments come from holy help. And that kind of help is so often redirected out of our, from our first intentions and our first efforts. That we're walking somewhere and you feel this presence of God, this thing that you recognize as Jesus walking with you, saying, go over here, I need you to do this. And it is counter, counter to what you are used to, but you go there because God says, at this moment, there's gonna be a holy moment, there's gonna be a thin place where my presence is felt. In the first century, Paul the Apostle, who was a follower of Jesus and had actually an, a, a, an encounter with Jesus after Jesus had risen, he had been arrested for declaring his faith in Jesus and doing it publicly. And so he is at house arrest in Rome, and he's concerned about all those other followers of Jesus that are having a tough moment, so he's sending them letters. And he sends a letter to the, the, to the gathering of people, the church in Ephesus. And as he sends it, he sends it as a circular letter, which means once they read it, pass it on because it's so vitally important they read these. And his letters always begin this way. He declares who he is. He declares his, his credentials. And then he says, I'm writing to you because Jesus wants you to know this. And generally, his first line is the line that establishes everything else that's going to be said throughout that entire letter. It is the foundation upon which all those other pieces will sit. And church, writing to the church in Ephesus, he, he says this, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord, Jesus Christ. We're going to focus on grace because grace is the root and peace is the fruit. I want to show you a picture of the Donaldson family. We have that. Hal is the blonde-haired guy in the middle. Nice smile. So when Hal was 12, his parents left them with a babysitter and headed out to a church business meeting because they're the pastors. About an hour into the meeting, there was a knock at the door. They opened the door, and there stood two uniformed policemen. And they said, we hate to tell you this, but your parents have been hit by a drunk driver and your father has been killed and your mother has been critically injured. They brought the kids out to the, to the porch where the neighbors had gathered and the police described to them what had happened and they said, someone needs to take the, the Donaldson children tonight so we don't have to take them down to the station because we don't know what we'll do. Bill and Levada Davis, some folks that are brand new to the church, raised their hand and said, we'll take them. Now, Bill and Levada lived at a single wide close by. Didn't have much, but they said, we'll take the kids. 
So the kids stayed with him the first night, and then the second night, and the third night, and the first week, and the second week, and the first month, and the second month, and the third month, almost an entire year. And in that time, Hal's mother finally came home from the, from the hospital, but she couldn't walk, so she stayed with them in that trailer, 10 people in a single wide. The kids would take turns sleeping on the floor. There weren't enough beds. The Davises went through all their savings. Bill began working double shifts at the quarry. Levada cooked and cleaned all day. Churches and neighbors would come by and drop off hand me sound clothes and bring food. But Bill noticed that Hal was, was coming under this oppression of poverty for the first time. And he could tell that Hal thought this was going to be his life forever. Knowing that, then Bill made this statement, said this to Hal, which changed his life. Don't allow the tragedy of your childhood to become a lifelong excuse. For where you start in life does not have to dictate where you end. Those are words of grace. That was a thin place. What he's saying to him is, why are you here? Why are you in our trailer? Because, because we know who you are. We know what your future can be. You're here because we're going to take care of you. And, and, and the people that are bringing your food are bringing here for a purpose. The people that are bringing hand-me-down clothes are bringing them for a purpose. The people who took you out to buy you Kenny's shoes, those really good sneakers, they're here for a purpose. And the purpose is this, that we see beyond your pain. We see a path that will take you past this place and that you do not have to stay in this situation. Those were words of grace. It's the whole idea that God gives where he finds empty hands. If we think we've got it all together, we don't need God. But when we say, I'm empty, I can't do this, God gives where there are empty hands. It's, a whole, it's holy love on the move. It's the Greek word for grace, charis, which means rejoice, which means in the middle of the thing that you face right now that you cannot overcome or you don't know how to get away from it, in that moment you can find joy because grace says, I got a path to get you out of here. Where does grace come from? Grace travels from power and position. So let's say today that you are an aspiring singer. You want to make it your career. How can you be, how can you be found? Who's going to help you? So you decide to go to the heiress tour. You get to go with Taylor Swift. You go hear her. You go to that Eras Tour concert, and you fill up that place with those 100,000 people in one place, and you decide you're going to stand up during the concert and begin to sing. You'll be discovered. Oh, no, you won't. No one's going to pay attention to you. Why? Because Taylor Swift has all the power and position. Every eye is focused on her. Everybody wants to see her. She makes a million bucks a day. I could do that. So you don't have a chance because someone else fills the power and position. The next week, you get a knock at the door, and there stands Taylor Swift, and she says, hey, I checked out your stuff on YouTube. you got talent. So I'm going to come back here a couple times a month, and I'm going to mentor you and train you and everything I know and how to sing and how to write and how to play guitar. I'm going to teach you all that stuff, and you're going to go on tour with me and see what I do because I can get you out of here to where you need to be. That's grace. Grace means that the person with the power and the position comes down to someone who is inferior to that superiority and says, here, everything I've got, I'm going to pour into you. So when Paul says grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, it means in this connection with Jesus, he comes to you not to condemn you, but to say, I see where you are, and I have come to pour out everything I have and give you my favor. I stoop down to where you are because you cannot come to me. I have come to you. For some of you in this place, you've got to stop trying to impress God because you stink at it. You can't. You can't impress God. 
You can't work your way into his good graces. He brings the grace to you and says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to work on you. You know that shame that you've carried all these years that keep you from moving ahead? You know that shame? There's a biblical word where he says, I redeem you. I love that. Redeem means that that he's going to look at you and say, you have shame, but I'm going to deem you worthy of going beyond that shame. I'm going to redeem you and give you a fresh start. That place where you feel so broken inside, he said, by my stripes, you're healed. I'm going to walk with you and heal you from that brokenness. That unforgiveness you feel toward the people that betrayed you, that put you in this spot, he says, I'm going to teach you how to give forgiveness and walk out of there because as long as you're not forgiving, you are tied to the problem and that moment and you'll never proceed ahead. He says, so I'm going to heal you. I'm going to work in your life. I'm going to change you because that's my grace. I ask people to ask themselves three questions every day. What is the lie I tell myself that just keeps me held deep? Second question, what is the mask I wear to cover my pain? Because if you don't deal with the pain, you keep wearing the mask. Third question is, what is the truth I need to tell myself? And Jesus comes and says, grace is here, and I'm going to tell you the truth, and I'll start telling yourself the truth. Jesus is coming for us. Grace not only travels from power and position, but it generates an outwardly pointing kindness. So now here's the interesting part of all this. As we recognize our brokenness and our inabilities and that sense of not feeling worthy or being enough, Jesus comes and pours his grace in us and says, you are enough. I'm taking you just the way you are. But here's the deal. You can't sit here and sit here until you're healed because I, grace is not a place, grace is not something that you, you put in a lockbox and hold for yourself. Grace is something you distribute. So while I'm walking with you, we're going to walk this direction. And while I'm healing you, I'm going to show you other people that you can heal. While I'm fixing your brokenness, I'm going to help you see someone who you can help fix their brokenness. While I'm giving to you, while you're receiving, you're going to give to others because that's what grace does. Recently, I was in Nicaragua. And we went out to see a woman who was part of the women's empowerment. And we looked at her business. We saw what she does. And, and we saw her, she had these incredible artworks. They're just beautiful. She does a, just a great job. And then she had food that she made and she had clothing that she made. And she had like a little general store. And she said for the first time, I don't have to count on you feeding my kids. I get to feed my kids. We have a saying at Convoy, we love feeding your kids, but we don't want to feed your grandkids. So she told her story. We were pretty impressed with that story. All of this is happening, by the way, through the local church. It all happens through the local church. And we're getting ready to leave, and, and our guide said, no, 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 don't go yet. And we walked down about from here to that wall. And there was like a, a, a little concrete room. And sitting outside it was Carlos. Carlos was a, he's a very handsome, probably in his 50s man, but very weathered, and, and he's had a rough life sitting in, in a chair, and, and they said, Carlos, tell us your story. So Carlos said, well, and he described a life of homelessness and, and, and a really tough life. And then he said these words, finding a rope and hanging myself was my greatest hope. Out behind where our friends are that we were visiting, there's a park, and they found him. And they said, come, come with us. And they, they gave him a room and they began to feed him and began to pour grace on him and began to ch- change his life and give him hope. And he began to heal up. But, but see, grace does not just stay in us. It has to be distributed. And what they didn't understand about Carlos until well into his healing is that Carlos is an incredible artist. And he said, I got to do something with what you're doing with me. So he began working with women's empowerment and teaching women how to be artists. 
and the things that you see on their walls and in their places of business that are being sold is a result of Carlos, who said, I can't just take grace in. I've got to give grace out. And the man who wanted to hang himself is now hanging his art through women's empowerment all over that region. God is in this place, and we don't, didn't even know it. Here's what grace does. The psalmist said it this way. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities. That word iniquities means all of those things deep down inside of you that you try to get rid of, but you can't. Paul the Apostle described it this way. The things I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I do. Anybody? feel that way at times? Yeah. He said, I'm going I'm to take care of those iniquities. I'm going to change that in you. Who heals all your diseases, all your brokenness. Who deems you again your life from destruction and crowns you with for living for loving forgiveness or loving kindness and tender mercies. Those are words that mean not only do you take in, but you give out. Grace makes us eligible, but also makes us responsible. And the incredible part of Carlo's story is that his grace didn't begin just in that location. It began 30 years before. Hal Donaldson got out of poverty and became a successful author and, and sports writer. He did ghostwriting, and they wanted him to do a book for some folks that were in Calcutta, India, who were helping people on the streets. And so he went to be with Mark and Hulda Buntain, and while he was with them, they said, you've got to find the person and go meet with them that have influenced us greatly. And he found himself with Mother Teresa. And while he was interviewing her, she interviewed him. And she said, Hal, what are you doing for the poor and suffering? Hal said, I, I pretty well figured you can't lie to Mother Teresa. So he said, I'm doing nothing. And then she gave these words that changed the trajectory of his life. Everybody can do something. You may not be able to feed a hundred, but you can feed one. Just go do the next kind thing that God puts in front of you. Look for the holy moment. He went back to his room for about three days and just wept because it had gone so deep inside of him. He didn't know what to do, so then he finally came back to the United States and he visited eight cities. And for, for three nights, he stayed on the streets, secretly, secretly interviewing addicts and prostitutes and gang members, riding the midnight shift with the cops. And he said, what... Mother Teresa stirred in my heart, being in those cities broke my heart. So he just did the next kind thing God put in front of him. He came back home, took out his savings of $300, bought groceries, put them in a borrowed pickup truck, and began to feed migrant workers in Northern California, doing the next kind thing God put in front of him, and there was a holy moment. So then he did the next one and the next one, and what started in 1994 with $300 of groceries and a borrowed pickup truck as of today, has served over 250 million people, has delivered over $2.5 billion worth of supplies. And here's what it did in 2023. Take a look. So I want to say to you, thank you. 
It's because of your partnership and others like you. Women are empowered. Children are fed. It's because of people like you who understand the holy moment that we're in the Gaza Strip right now. That, that we are still in Haiti. In fact, three containers, three, three huge deliveries are on their way to Haiti right now, and although we can't go right through the main sources, we still have people who believe that we don't feed the hungry so they come to Jesus, but we feed the hungry because we came to Jesus, and it's in us, and you've made that possible. In writing to the church in Ephesus, Paul said these words, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do or that we should walk in them. It simply means this. Literally, it means, for we are God's fabric. Manufactured in Jesus. Weaving himself, his graces into us the moment we connected with him. To do significant works, to see those moments and not miss them. that he has prepared in advance for us to see, that as he's been working in us and we walk into a situation inside of us, we see the opportunity and the spirit of God in us says, don't miss this one. We say, but I don't have the resources. I, I'm, I'm shy, I don't wanna go. I, yeah, we all have those reasons. But God says, well, if, I see, if you see the opportunity, I'll give you the ability and the resources that you will see it and you will fill it up into full capacity because he created you. He created you to know the people you know so you can network with them and say, we gotta take care of this problem. It's what he created the church to do, these called out ones. This is grace. On a recent trip to Latin America, one of my friends entered into that country with a group of friends they were picked up at the airport and they then made their way to a place called the Academy. It's where women are being trained in business. It can be cosmetology, it can be computer science, it can be growing crops, it can be making clothes. And the unique thing about this is that there's a large portion of the women that are in that Academy who are rescued out of trafficking these who have been bullied above all else, who have been abused, who thought there was no way out. They walk into the academy and, and there they see the joy, the charis, the grace. They, they watch and, and they feel the, the, the hope in that place because hope grows out of grace. They said that they were walking through looking at, and then one particular person caught the eye of our friend. It was a woman teaching cosmetology, you know, taking care of nails and, and, and facials and hair. And, and, and he said she just, she exuded this, 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 this joy. She exuded a, an energy. It just, she just, she had their attention because it was just this presence. It was like this was a holy place. So they left there and went to the hotel. Next morning they got up because they were going to take a tour of, of orphanages and farms and businesses where these ladies have graduated and are now doing their thing. They got on the bus and there was this 17-year-old girl who her mother let her get out of school that day so she could practice her English. Louisa was gonna be their interpreter for the day. So they visited all those places and they ended up the day and they took Louisa back to her house, dropped her off, and they headed for the restaurant and as they did, they went through the area called Tracks End. Tracks End is the place with all the doors. And if the door is shut, it means the woman has a client. If the door is open, she's waiting for someone to take in and do what she's been sent there to do. They felt the contrast between the hope and then the hopelessness they found going down that street. And it moved them emotionally. They got to the restaurant 
And the leader had disappeared for a while. He came back in and he was weeping. And they said, what are you crying about? He said, I just heard a story that I didn't know. And I've been here a lot, but I didn't know this. He said, 14 years ago, a woman came here in this town to visit her sister, and her sister sold her to a pimp. And then the pimp destroyed her papers so she could never leave. And night after night, the woman cried because she had no hope. Then she began to cry out, if there's a God, you've got to help me, you've got to help me, you've got to help me. And one night, in her dreams, Jesus came to her. And he said, I'm going to rescue you. She continued to work for three weeks, skimming off the top of the money to keep some for herself so that she could get bus fare. Three weeks later, on a Sunday morning, she awakened her three-year-old daughter. And she said, we're going to leave. Jesus said he's going to rescue us. We're going to go find a church and ask Jesus to come in our heart and be baptized. And her daughter said, I want that too, Mommy. And that's what they did. When the service was over, they said, where are you going? What are you going to do? And she said, I don't know. And they said, we want to take you to the academy. And the guy said, what you need to understand is we have already met that woman. Marisa is the one who was teaching cosmetology, the one that is so full of grace. She's the one who God changed that day. And oh, by the way, you've met her, her daughter. Her name is Louisa. You met her. She's your tour guide. She now has found hope. How do you get out of hell's worst and at the same time bring heaven's best to others? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to end with two questions. First question is this, where do you need to be rescued? See, God has been speaking to you in holy moments, but you haven't recognized it. He's calling you. Where, where is, where's the lid on your life? You can't get past that thing. Where's the pain that has paralyzed you? Where's the shame that tells you that you're not good enough? What's broken and never been fixed? He's here this morning. This is a holy moment. And he's ready to come to you and not demand that you be a better person, but come and say, let's walk this together. Second question is this, who around you needs to be rescued? Who needs to see a path out of their pain? You say, but I don't know what to do. I don't have the resources. He didn't ask you to have the resources or the knowledge. He just said, you go do it. I'll give it to you. Because that's what grace does. Just go do the next kind thing God puts in front of you. It doesn't take a genius to know that the world is in trouble. And the world needs peace. Peace comes from grace. It comes from a bunch of holy moments which come from a bunch of holy help. So can I encourage you this week, just do the next kind thing God puts in front of you. Would you join a convoy of hope? Will you join a revolutionary army of grace telling the world, we're coming for you? God bless you.